Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, would everyone please rise and join us for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening again, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, tonight is the first of four scheduled budget work sessions. Uh, tonight is really uh, an introduction to uh, where we are in the process. And uh, uh, once we're finished with the budget work session, we are going to go straight into our planning session. That of course is a public meeting as well. And obviously everyone is welcome to uh, hang in there and join us for that. So as I said, tonight is our first uh, budget work session. It's uh, a very interesting year in that uh, the governor has kind of put forth um, multiple choices as to where this, where this might go, uh, depending on what the federal government does. Uh, it makes our uh, job and certainly the administration's job very challenging to say the least, but we are going to uh, do our best to get through it. So uh, with that said, I will turn it over to Mrs. Burns. Thank you, Mr. Geller, and good evening. Uh, my name is Bernadette Burns, and as superintendent of schools, it is my responsibility to ensure that our West Islip students have the opportunity to complete a truly well-rounded education, including exposure to the arts, humanities, sciences, social sciences, English, and math, as well as myriad extracurricular activities. This will allow them to be prepared for college, the 21st century workforce, and global citizenship. It is also my responsibility, in cooperation with all staff members concerned, to prepare, to prepare and present the recommended budget to the Board of Education for review. The Board is responsible for the preparation and presentation of the budget to the residents who vote to approve or disapprove on the third Tuesday in May. This evening, I'm going to give you a brief overview and Mrs. Elisa Pilati, our Assistant Superintendent for Business, will go over the 2021-22 budget development process and the tax cap calculation. The budget is a work in progress and this is the first of four work sessions, all of which are open to the public. In subsequent meetings, which we hope to hold in person, you will be provided with more information about our budget development in specific departments, including curriculum and instruction, technology, the arts, special education, athletics, facilities, and security. The world has changed greatly since each of us has entered our chosen professions and the skills necessary to navigate in today's world are very different. So the question becomes, how do we prepare our students for life beyond high school? As we develop this budget, as we do every year, we centered our work around our mission statement and our students' needs for both the present and the future, needs that have it been informed this year by the influences of the COVID-19 pandemic. The release of the governor's executive budget represents the beginning of the state budget negotiations between the governor and the legislature. There is an April 1st deadline for the state budget, which provides our school districts, all school districts with critical information about state aid as we plan our budget for the upcoming school year. Overall, proposed state aid for school districts is projected to increase by $2.1 billion this increase is attributed to the allocation of more than $3.8 billion in federal coronavirus response and relief supplemental appropriations act, the CRRSA stimulus funds. They are stimulus funds. This is the second consecutive budget in which federal money substitute for state spending, spending reductions. Last year, we saw the one-time pandemic adjustment that reduced school aid by the amount of the CARES Act allocation. This year, we have the proposed CRRSA allocation that will fill the gap left by what is being called the local district funding adjustment. 
So we more or less are robbing Peter to pay Paul. Note that this LDFA is similar to the gap elimination adjustment, which many of you will probably remember we fought so hard and assertively against for a long time. And it had great implications to our district. Um, in effect, during that period of time, the district lost the equivalent of approximately $25 million, monies that were never recovered. The executive budget proposes to hold foundation aid amounts flat for a second consecutive year at 2019-20 levels. The proposal includes no adjustments, updates, or other changes to the statutory formula. It appears that West Islip state aid is projected to increase by 7.25%. This is deceiving, however. Last year, when New York state was threatening to cut aid up to 20%, our district prudently and conservatively under budgeted our foundation aid by $2.4 million or 10%. This year's state aid projection is based on that 10% reduction. So it appears that the aid increase is greater than it really is. We know now that we are getting our full allotment. The governor has proposed consolidating 11 expense-based and categorical aid formulas into a new service aid category, which would be reduced and frozen starting in 2021-22. The 11 aid categories would then effectively be eliminated in all future years. This could negatively impact districts by limiting the predictability, which is very important to us, and potential growth of these collective aids many of which are based on enrollment. This would also negatively impact districts that share services through BOCES and districts facing increasing transportation costs. During the COVID shutdown in the spring of 2020, districts used transportation resources to provide services to remote students, including meal delivery, instructional materials, and mobile hotspots. The executive budget is proposing to make these activities eligible for transportation aid. Unfortunately, this proposal still leaves millions of dollars in transportation expenses from 2019-20 unaidable. During the shutdown, many districts incurred standby costs, such as transportation staff salary and benefits. That would not be aidable. Layoffs during this time would have contributed to the historic unemployment levels and the Federal CARES Act directed districts, quote, to the extent practicable to continue to pay its employees and contractors during the period of any disruptions or closures related to coronavirus. Many districts in good faith believe that continuing to employ bus drivers and other transportation staff fell within that directive. The executive budget is proposing to permanently eliminate the state share of costs related to CSE placements for districts outside of New York City and transfer the state's responsibility for maintenance costs of state operated schools for the blind and deaf directly onto school districts. This change was first adopted in last year's enacted budget with a repeal date of April 1st, 2021. The new proposal would create a permanent cost shift increasing districts burden throughout the state from 38.4% to 56.7%. The executive budget proposes a $1.3 billion reduction in star exemption reimbursements to districts. This reduction is essentially a backdoor cut in state supports to districts. The executive budget is also proposing to eliminate the ability for property owners to age up into the enhanced STAR exemption program and require them, requiring them to take the STAR credit instead. The credit requires taxpayers to pay the full amount of their property taxes and then receive a STAR credit rebate from the state, effectively increasing our residents out of pocket costs for individuals seeking to lower their property tax bill. We are still in the process of enrolling our incoming pre-K and kindergarten students. So um, we are just be and we are just beginning the course enrollment process at the high school. So we will not talk about course sections or class sizes this evening, as that will be a topic for a future work session. However, note that we continue to face declining enrollment. This year, we anticipate 334 students will graduate from the high school 
and the incoming kindergarten class will be approximately 240 students. Our overall enrollment will decline by approximately 2.5%, which is consistent with the, decrease, uh, the decreases we have experienced in the past few years, generally ranging between 2.5 and 3%. Mrs. Burns, can I interrupt you for one second? Uh, so unless there are any questions, I'd like to now introduce Mrs. Elisa Pilati, who will take you through the first draft of the 2021-22 budget. Okay, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Mrs. Pilati? I think uh, Ms. LaRosa has a question. Can you hear me, Elise? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, just going back to the um, enrollment, I know we're not discussing class sizes or anything tonight. Um, I'm just curious, are we at the end of our um, BOCES report uh, that projected enrollment into the future? Are we at the end of that cycle? Can you hear me? She's muted. You're muted. Actually, it ends, I'm having a problem with my speaker. I'm going to, once Mrs. Pilates starts, I'm going to switch to my laptop. I apologize. So I didn't hear the question initially, Mrs. LaRosa. So that report, that demographic survey was conducted in 2016 and it, I don't wanna say it expires, but it took us through 2026. Mm -hmm. However, um, the board had requested in a previous meeting that we reach out to Western Suffolk BOCES who conducted the survey um, and get an updated survey, which we have done. We have provided them with most of the data they have requested. Um, one element uh, is outstanding, which they actually will have tomorrow. And they are going to go ahead and update those numbers. We know that through this year, those children have been born, but everything else was speculative. Because when you do something in 2016, those children, um, you know, they're, they're making a projection for 2026. And those children are still five years out from, um, you know, joining right. us. So, but the but the the children that were here were those projections consistent with what they? Uh, we actually declined a little bit um, more aggressively than they had projected. Is that what you're asking? I am. I yes. Am. Yes. The numbers are lower than we projected. Than they projected. Not so a lot, but some about I'd say about five percent. So they're now going to give us an analysis, what, five years ahead, 10 years ahead? What are you looking for? They'll do 2021 to 2031. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Burns. Good evening, everyone. Consistent with previous years, we have three main budget goals. We strive to have a balanced budget that is fiscally responsible and operationally efficient. We want to maintain and enhance our current student programs and services while staying within the tax cap. Maintaining fiscal, trans fiscal and financial transparency is another important budget goal. We make the annual auditor's report, both internal and external, available on our district's website. And as we go through this budget process, various documents and presentations will be available on the district's website. Tonight is the first of four budget works workshops in which the board and administration will publicly discuss the budget development. Each year, the budget development process starts in the early fall. We analyze budget trends and estimate various renewal rates based on historical data and industry projections. As an example, a very common example for districts is health insurance rates. Health insurance rates change every calendar year on January 1st. So the last six months of fiscal year 2021-22, which is from January through June, will remain unknown throughout this budget process. So something like health insurance will remain pretty much half an estimate and half an actual amount for our budget. The district considers changes in contractual obligations with our bargaining units and evaluates all existing programs. Central office also reviews all district staffing needs. In early December, our administrators submit their budgets to central office for review, and we hold several meetings to go over the projected budgets with each administrator. Central office goes through various versions of the budget line by line. In February, beginning tonight, the board discusses various components of the budget throughout these budget workshops. And ultimately, the board will adopt the budget and hold a budget hearing. And most importantly, on May 18th, the community will vote on the annual budget. Since the tax cap was enacted in 2012, every district's budget formula looks like this. 
we are first required to calculate our restricted tax levy. And then we are to consider any anticipated state aid, any other revenues that we anticipate earning, appropriated fund balance, any use of reserves, and what we are left with, the remaining amount, is the district's expenditure budget for the next fiscal year. The tax levy limit became effective for school districts starting with the 2012-13 budget. The tax levy limit allows districts to increase their property tax levy from one year to the next by 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less. The tax cap is now permanent and has been for a couple of years. The calculation is based on a multi-step formula that is provided by the Office of the State Comptroller. There are adjustments and exclusions that can increase it, as well as low inflation, excuse me, low inflation that can decrease it. So a 2% rate of inflation doesn't necessarily result in a 2% tax levy increase. And I feel like this summary of the allowable tax levy growth factor clearly shows that a 2% allowable tax levy growth factor does not always result in a 2% tax levy limit for a district. In the middle column, you can see what the allowable tax levy growth factor was for New York State going all the way back to 2013-14. And at the end of 2020, the inflation factor for this past year increased by 1.23%. That makes the allowable levy growth factor for 2021-22, 1.23%. On the right-hand side, you can see the historical allowable tax levy increases for West Islip. Like almost every other district, our allowable increase differs from the growth factor due to the exclusions and adjustments in the formula, most common example being debt service payments, which most districts have. So while the change in the consumer price index is 1.23% for the 2021-22 school year, West Islip will have an allowable tax levy increase of 1.6%. And this is our projected tax levy limit calculation, which I will take you through step by step, just to show you how we arrive at the 1.6%. So the very first thing we do is we start with our prior year tax levy, which is the $87,223,610. That's our 2020-21 tax levy. This is the amount of property tax revenue that was levied by the district for the 2021 school year. We multiply that amount by the tax base growth factor. This is the year-to-year -year increase in the full value of taxable real property in a district. It is due to physical or quantity change. So as an example, you can have a change in growth from new construction or additions or improvements to real property. It's important to note that this factor is never going to be less than one. We then add in any pilots that are receivable in the 20, 2021 school year. Pilots stand for payments in lieu of taxes. Certain commercial property owners will enter into a pilot agreement to make annual payments instead of making a property tax payment for a negotiated period of time. Our district has one property that has a pilot agreement, which is a veterinary office. We then subtract out the taxes that are levied to pay for any local capital costs, which is the 3 million 171,957 you see there. This is the amount of the 2020-21 tax levy that's necessary to support expenditures resulting from the improvement of our, of our facilities. This actually includes debt service payments, uh, the district share of local capital expenditures that were made by their local BOCES, and it is net of any building aid that we will receive or have received. So we then take that amount and we multiply it by the allowable levy growth factor, which we just saw in the previous slide is the 1.23%. We subtract out the pilots that we expect to receive in the 2021-22 school year, which we receive from the town of Islip. This gives us the tax levy limit before any exclusions. We then add in the tax levy to pay for the local capital costs, similar to what we did above. It's just the amount that we're now estimating for the 21-22 school year. And it is important to note here that not only does this amount include our debt service payments, our local share of our capital expenditures paid by BOCES. It also includes an amount um, budgeted for a bus purchase this year. And again, it is net of any building aid that we expect to receive. 
So finally, we arrive at our end result, which is our allowable tax levy limit, which is showing an increase of 1.6%. So our tax levy for next year will be the $88,619,244. And this calculation actually has to be submitted to New York State, the Comptroller's Office, by March 1st. So just to summarize that very exciting formula, this is just a high level our tax levy is looking to increase by 1.4 million and the change is about 1.6% of an increase. Okay. One of our basic budget goals is of course to have a balanced budget where our revenues equal our expenses. We have done the first step in the budget formula and we have calculated what our restricted tax levy is. We have also received our projected state aid for next year, which as Mrs. Burns stated, it is showing a, an increase of 7.25% over the prior year budgeted amount. We also have projected out what our local revenues will be and we know what our appropriated fund balance will be. So right now our expenses are slightly more than our revenues. However, the budget process is not yet complete. There are a few items that may help address the small budget shortfall that we have. Our teaching staff, for example, um, contractually must notify us of any retirements by March 1st. So any future drafts of the budget may include some retirements. Also, the governor's state aid proposal has historically increased by the time we receive the final numbers and the final state aid run by April 1st. We are also fortunate that our district is fully funded in our reserves. And if another one-time appropriation of reserves is necessary to help close any budget gap, our fiscal health would not be compromised. This year on the ballot, we will actually have two propositions. The first being, of course, our school budget vote. The second will be the use of the capital reserve. So voter authorization is not only required to establish a capital reserve, but it's also required each time a district wishes to expend funds from that reserve. The capital reserve was established and approved by the community during our May 2019 budget vote. Capital reserve funds allow a district to save money for future capital projects that would otherwise have to be funded through a bond or through our annual budget. And of course, the best part of a capital reserve is that it comes at no additional cost to the taxpayer. The capital reserve is funded through remaining surplus monies at year end. And as of our last fiscal year end, which was June 30th, 2020, the capital reserve had a balance of four million $23,645. So we are required to disclose the projects we would like to put out. And this is a list of the proposed, proposed projects the district would like to do with some of the capital reserve funds. These seven projects, as you can see here, are estimated to cost approximately 1,680,000. These numbers represent estimates that were developed um, from consultation with our architects. District-wide, we would like to replace water fountains with water bottle filling stations. At Manitoc and Okunok, we would like to install air conditioning mini splits in the main office and the nurse's office. And it is important to note here that the other school buildings have already received uh, these installations through, bond, through recent bond work. The campus style fencing at the high school uh, will be replaced along Montauk Highway and Higby Lane. Four restrooms in total will be renovated, two at the high school and two at Bayview. We would like to replace the auditorium stage curtains at the high school. And we'll be replacing the interior walk-in freezer and refrigerator at the high school. And it is important to note that upon completion of these projects, any unspent funds would be returned to the capital reserve fund. Because again, these are estimates so it's not going to be exact. So if there is any remaining money, which is likely, that just simply goes back into the capital reserve fund to be spent at a later year. And are these projects payable? Yes, they are. Um, I have to verify that they all are. Yeah, the yes, the yes. Right, there, yes, there's one that I believe isn't, so I, and the fencing, so I will uh, verify that. And, and then what happens with the money that we get back from the aid? That would go back to the general funds and then perhaps wind its way back into capital reserve at some point? Right. Any aid that we get automatically goes into our general fund. Thank you. Sure. 
For 21-22 school year, we have two board trustee seats open. The nominating petitions for those seats will be available at the district office on March 8th. Our next three budget work sessions will take place on March 9th, the 23rd, and April 13th in the Beach Street Auditorium, taking place at 7.30 p.m. We will be discussing curriculum at our March 9th meeting, buildings and ground and security at our March 23rd meeting, and on April 13th, we will cover all of our state aid and revenue. The nominating petitions for those board trustee seats are due back to district office by April 19th. The budget will be adopted on April 20th. And on May 6th, we will have the public budget hearing. And of course, May 18th, the third Tuesday of the month in May, we will have our annual budget vote in the high school gymnasium between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Okay. Um, I, the budget's a budget increase. Um, where is that number, Elise? Well, the budget to budget increase with our restricted tax levy right now would be about 2.55%. Uh, however, we do have a small budget gap of about 461,000 right now. Right, but before you showed a slide and I, I don't oh. see it in the budget book with the exact number. Um, in the budget book, it would be under the budget draft in your tab called budget draft one, I believe. There was a summary page right before the detailed budget. I think that's what you're referring to. Mr. Pilati, while uh, Mrs. LaRosa looks for that, um, can we possibly have for the next meeting a list of what's in this budget uh, that would fall on, you know, as um, one-time expenses? Sure. Thank you. That, that, Cause that, that would be um, things that I would be comfortable using reserves for. Sure. Thank you. And I don't see the number I'm looking for at least, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, you had it in a slide before it was a, a million something. That was the budget. Let me go back. I can, I can go back if you want to tell me which. Um, right here. This is, okay. This one. Yeah. It's hard for me to see when I, when I have to close you all down for a little while. Um, No, this wasn't it. Can you go back? Sure. That's a tax. I don't think that's it. No. All right. You know what? It'll come to me, but I want to move on. I want, I want to talk about a couple other things in here. Um, you have a, a page in here, West Islip Revenue Budget Analysis page. I have never seen it presented like this before, so I just want to know what I'm looking at. The, the pages are not numbered, so I can't give you a page number. Um, mm -hmm. I think but, I know what you're talking about. Okay, so it's a spreadsheet, it's, it's an Excel. Yep. Uh, accounts on the left are A and they're numbered, right? You have 17, 18 actual, 18, 19 actual, 19, yes. so, 21 budgeted, and then yep. 21, 22 budget. Okay, those columns there. Yes. So, um, I'm assuming that this is a, a summary of line by line items that we can take a look at to see where all this is. And sure, where... this, if, if you will, this represents the revenue that we budget and we have to estimate when we do that budget formula. So this is simply, if we were to run like when you get on a monthly basis at the finance committee, the revenue status report. So mm -hmm. this is essentially all of our actual revenue that we have um, earned over the past, I just like to give you historical. So I, I provided three years of actual revenue earned as well as the current school year's budgeted revenue and projected no, budget. So when I, for example, look at recreation camp here and yes. we have an actual revenue of 35,950 for the 1920 school year. Yes. Those are fees that you've taken in to run that, yes. that recreation camp, okay? Yep. And, um, do we have an amount of what it actually costs to run that camp? Is mm -hmm. that? If I, 
it, this is actually an, it's interesting you picked this one because just as a little bit of backup, um, and you might not remember this from the, the audit, this was a little over a year ago, our external auditors, I think this was my first year, so it might've been two years ago, um, our external auditors noted that all of our rec, like our rec camp and the summer boys volleyball and those types of accounts you see there, like wrestling and the different camps, they were initially being recorded in the uh, F fund, which is historically used for special education. So, mm-hmm. and again, it's, it's a revenue and it's expense. So it doesn't really, it, we were accounting for it properly, but they just recommended it really shouldn't be in the F fund. Let's move it to the general fund, which is why you don't see anything prior to 2019, 20 here. So mm-hmm. it really just came onto our general fund books, if you will, in 2019-20, because prior to that, it was being recorded in the F fund. But, but, but what I'm asking you is this, the, the, the 35,000 that you're projecting as revenue from that camp is not actually paying all the bills for that camp. The school district and in the budget is also money. Well, correct, camp. right, right. There's, there's related so, expenditures in the budget. Mm-hmm. Right, so where, where would we find that information? Okay. I, they would be, I, and you know what, I could, um, if you want, if you, it might be easier, I could follow it up with an email tomorrow because fine. Uh, you know what, a I'm few not, different I'm accounts. I'm not going to look at it right this second, but sure. I would like to see, you know, what the school district is budgeting in addition to that 35,000 in fees we're collecting yep. to what we are budgeting to support them as part of our regular school budget. Cause these are summer programs, right? Right. You have listed right. Yep. Okay. Um, and so I guess I, I probably want to do that comparison along the line for all of the, uh, the summer stuff that we see in here. Sure, no problem. I have another question on that same page. Um, okay. Let me get my ruler because I can't see. <laughs> Made it nice and tiny. My ruler. Um, so uh, rental of real property, I'm assuming these are currently right now all of our rentals that we have out there and what we have coming in. That's correct, yep. All right. Um, there's a decrease of cost, but you have Missera separate. Is there a reason why Missera is separated out just because we're no longer receiving any revenue from that? Missera has historically always had its own revenue code. Um, okay. So that's just the way it's, it's been. All right. yep. that's, that's why. So why the drop then? Well, we're no longer taking any money in so that we don't have a tenant. Not, not Missera. Why the drop in the rental of real property line from 8, 833, 482 to 806, 807? strictly a result of the leases that we have. So um, as you might recall, there's been one or two um, minor minor adjustments to I think it was like the ask us lease and one other one so it's just I basically take all of the tenants and I so those, all of- tenants, so those tenants giving up space has mm-hmm. have dropped our um revenue yes. and but what's the percentage of increase just by virtue of yearly increases for the leasehold I'd have to look but I, I feel like I'd it's like about three percent I'd have to look but that's strictly it should, a it should be three per, it should be three percent yeah okay. I think it is three all right and then I have just have some questions if nobody else wants to I, I have other questions can I keep going Steve go, go ahead thank you so on the um, budget analysis 21 22 um, other income, two million two hundred eighty-eight thousand three hundred seven. What is the other income representing? That actually represents the majority of what you were just that other page you were referring to. Oh, okay. All right. Yep, it's just a summary. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. And then I just have some line items that jump out at me, and it might be just a, f- a function of you consolidating some or changing some up. But I just want clarification. Sure. Yeah, that did happen this year a lot, especially in facilities. We tried to consolidate some of our account codes. Okay. On page three, uh, BOCI service, A1430.492. Just have a big binder. Just give me one second. Three, go ahead. There's a jump here of um, 22%. 
which is, I mean, you know, it sounds worse than it is from 67 to 52. Yep. We actually include, included an employee assistance program this year, and that um, increase is accounted for there. Got it. Okay. Yep. We've, we've talked about that often, right? Yes. Yeah. Next page, um, page five, 543. I think this is where we're hitting some consolidations. Am I assuming that everything I see in parentheses there below yes. uh, line 1620 is just consolidated up into custodial supplies? Mm-hmm. It appears to be an 87% increase, but it's not because you, you're eliminating those budget lines underneath it. Yes. Correct? So That's correct. All the 1620, if, if it starts with the 1620 or 1621, it's facilities. And we did a lot of consolidating um, to try to just make it more manageable for James when he's using his budget. So as an example, like paint supplies and a couple other things, we tried to consolidate them to call them like custodial supplies. Um, so where you see a lot of decreases, you'll, you'll also see a corresponding increase as an example on page five yes, in something called custodial supplies, uh, account 162508. Yeah, you I see it. it went up from 55,000 to 103, but it really isn't an increase. So that'll, str so that'll stream, streamline transfers later on. That's yeah. right, yeah. Yes, however, for our purposes, right, the responsibility of our fiduciary responsibility, we no longer see the line items that you're now eliminating and understand what goes into that custodial supply line. Actually, I do I could, now. Go ahead. I'm sorry, if I could just interrupt you for one second. If you go to the tab called B and G, I put in each individual worksheet and I actually printed that one in color for you so you can see where everything's going. And I just mm -hmm. made notes for you guys so you can see. As an example, I color coded um, like the ones that are blue are going to be combined together. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the tab called B and G in the back of the, your binder, I just flipped to it. I see it, but Good. and that's great. That's great, right? However, what what I'm trying to kind of get at mm -hmm. at the moment is that um, right now we're not going line by line and going to you know question you on about the amounts that James is spending in his budget, but Right. At some point this year or in future years, we might. And we won't be able to question or make any, you know, decisions, you know, good decisions about where we may be able to eliminate some expenses when we need to. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not concerned about it now. I'm concerned about in the future that we're taking away information that we might not necessarily need to look at right now, but in the future, we may. We may say, okay, you know, James has to give us a 10% reduction on his right. NG lines because we need to close that gap. And because mm -hmm. we're looking at one general line that says custodial supplies, it makes our work harder. I understand. And I think that's why um, board members work harder, I should say. No, I, I understand what you're saying. And I like to give you and the board, I should say, um, a historical view. So when I break it down by department, if you notice, I always like to provide at least three years of actual expenditures, of, um, the current year budget and then the anticipated budget. And going forward in, in the future where, as an example, since we're on B&G, you can see, uh, James, it, like obviously the, the total facilities, the budget's actually going down by $12,000, but you can see where we have something like contracted services, that's a very big category. It's a very big budget number. It's um, we're budgeting 275,000 there. So James actually breaks down that number even further and says, okay, we have Winter Brothers, we have Cardinal Control. So we do try to provide even more detail for you. What I'm saying is, where is that? So I see contracted. Okay, contracted on line 25, services. contracted services. Okay, so we're going to a different part of the budget book to look up what contracted services are in there. Correct. Yeah, because other, yeah, I don't put it in the um, actual budget document. That's why we provide the Excel sheets. Really big book, right? So I, know. I like paper. Sorry. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I'm just, I'm really, I'm just trying to, I, know. I guess, project ahead. Steve Geller, do you understand what I'm saying? I do, but I think the uh, information is in there. It's just a okay. function of having to go to the, um, the, the backup, All right. which, which is provided. So I, I, mean, I think I think as long as 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 long as the it's it's broken down with the granularity that you're requesting, I, I don't have a problem going to the back of the book. 
as long as it's there. Because we've been doing, we've been looking at it for 10 years and there might be <laughs> other board members that, that, won't, that haven't been. So this is my point to you. We've had that, you know, benefit of knowing, you know, that there were other things in there that we could possibly, you know, whittle away when we need to. And when you present it with one line and one large number, it's, it's, a, it's a harder look, it's hard to see for people who are not used to looking at a budget this size. That's all I'm saying. I understand. Okay. I, I also, um, just to, to speak to Steve's point very quickly also, um, when we go through our audits, it does minimal, uh, minimize the amount of budget transfers, which obviously um, the, the auditors like to see us keep to a minimum. So it does make it easy in that regard, but okay. I can definitely see your, your point as well. All right, so then, all right, so the same thing is going to apply to then you, you went over contracted services. Interestingly, that was something else I had circled, Elise. So I'm getting to that one because okay. you see the, the big increase there. And then right above it, maintenance um, and upkeep, that's another one that has a lot of different items in it. Yep. Right. And that's why it's, it's increasing by 38%. That is correct. Um, uh, I'm going to move over to the clerical additional hours 2010, another increase 71%. I know the, not, the amount is not large, but the right. of changes and that's just adding clerical hours because we need them. That's correct. Um, which, which page are you? I just want to double check what number you're looking at. Um, seven to 43. Yes. I tried to also go by um, our prior year actuals to make it more in line with what we've been spending historically. So that one was just an adjustment according to our historical budgets. Page 31 of 43. Okay. Over there. Yep, 2610, first line. So there's an 89% an increase in 7 through 12 teachers for the library. That we add, are we adding a teacher? Yes, we are adding the position. I believe we talked about it um, at the, it probably, it could have been the last board meeting. I'm not positive. Um, I believe it's called an L a library so on i don't know if you want to help me out with that name of the position we just added <laughs> yes it's an elementary technology integration specialist thank you and i don't know that we've spoken about it in depth yet but it's something we want to present at the at the curriculum um presentation right. thank you i haven't heard that so yeah, yeah. but but we're hoping to see an offsetting amount in the it within um the another low place in the teacher budget line. So that adding that position is not necessarily in our budget to budget number increase. You're offsetting adding that. So I should see a negative somewhere else. Well, well, it depends on what happens with our retirements in, in the, this current week. So okay. we'll have more information for the next budget meeting, but that's a proposal we'd like to make considering the amount of technology that we have moved toward. So even so Bernadette, we used to have a page that listed all of our additions, right? Right from the outset, right? It was one page. It was where, where we have to add five teachers or whatever, you know. Yes. Whatever. Actually, I have that. I can share it. Okay. So we usually have that in our budget book. Maybe we can get that. Sure. I apologize. I'll send that. I, I'm, see if I mentioned that. I'm going to send that to you tomorrow. Okay. Yep. All right. I think those are all my questions for now. Please, uh, I had I had I had one or two, and uh, <laughs> thanks for, thanks for putting everything together. In, in the same in the same line, you know, following what Amber was going, kind of going down the larger increase, computer assisted instruction. Obviously, we made big investments this year. Well, some of, some of the next year is that a carryover for additional? Um, Where are you looking? A page uh, thirty four of forty three. The total for computer assisted instruction. Um, the whole, it's about a $740,000 expense increase. Is that just investment in technology from the, the remote learning? Yeah, I would have to go through um, 
that section, but I believe it's the, I believe it is a, the majority of that increase is related to our technology efforts and our state aided computer hardware line. Okay. So the both these services are, is, is the hardware increase? Well, if you look at page 33, you'll see the um, state aided hardware, computer hardware number. And now is that just replacement or is that additional? I'm just gonna flip to my technology. If you don't mind, just give me one second. I, do, I, no. I think some of it is we've been making a shift from within the curriculum budgets um, just trying to realign some of the budget lines and who's doing the ordering. So I think some of it, not all, but some of it is accountable in that regard. Okay. Um, some of it was so additional software. Uh, yep, if you go to the IT budget in the back, we actually have a breakdown of that entire expense. And it's, um, it includes all of our Chromebook middle school replacement, our high school, elementary, um, high school staff, flat panel displays. If you look at the IT budget Excel tab, it's actually the one to the third page in your IT tab. And you look for that budget code, which is number 23. And you can see the breakdown of, and the majority of it is really related to our Chromebook replenishment. Okay. That makes sense. And, um... I know Amory covered a lot of it and guidance. I know there's an increase in guidance. Uh, that was a position that we added. Was that yes. correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay. That'll be on the list tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same thing with psychology services, page 37, right? We, no, we added a, we're adding a social worker, right? No. That's correct. So correct. Social worker at the high school was added. So that number increased about 117%. Yes. Right. Okay. Yep. Good. No, those are the, some of the things that, that stood out. So thanks for putting everything together. Sure. Okay. Ms. Pilati, if you, if you don't mind, um, it's great to send it to us tomorrow, but if you can also include it um, in the presentation next week, just so we can circle back and uh, let everybody have a look at it. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. The curricular presentation, Mr. Geller, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, we can maybe yeah. at the at, right before the we one. start that. Yeah, the, yeah at the, typically at the we top. do include all of those extras in that presentation. Right. So yeah, that, yeah, that's great. Any, anybody else have questions? Okay, very good. Um, so as uh, as mentioned, next uh, in two weeks, two weeks from tonight, same time. Uh, hopefully, we will be live. That's our intent at this point. Um, and in person, uh, we will be discussing curriculum and instruction budgets, and we hope to uh, see you all there. Uh, Ms. Burns, where are we hoping to hold that? Uh, I think we will move to the Beach Street Auditorium as opposed to the cafeteria. Right. I think we have a little more space to spread out. We're still limited by the governor's executive order to a total of 50. So if we are live, we will post those links on the website. People can register in advance. And of course, if we do hit that 50 person threshold, then we will be live streaming um, the presentation as we did tonight. Okay, thank you. So folks, if you uh, uh, wanna get in, make a, a reservation uh, as soon as we have the, uh, the link up on the website, uh, we hope to, uh, to see you there and then, uh, as I said, this, this is now uh, will conclude the budget presentation and we're going to go right into our planning session. So please let the uh, record reflect that all board members are present. I know I don't, uh, not required to, but uh, I'd like to start every meeting with a pledge, so if everybody would uh, please rise and join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I, I, I guess I'm predictable, huh, Mr. Taylor? Okay, um, 
I say that because Mr. Taylor anticipated and had the, uh, the flag uh, backdrop uh, ready. Okay, can I have a motion to uh, approve the minutes of the February 4th, 2021 Board of Education regular meeting? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, no announcements. Uh, personnel? Mr. Keller. Thank you, Mr. Geller. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of the leave of absence pursuant to the Family Medical Leave Act for Elizabeth Dottie World Languages effective March 12th, 2021 through June 14th, 2021. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of the leave of absence amended pursuant to the Family Medical Leave Act for Nicole Preparis Health, effective October 28th, 2019 through January 24th, 2020. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I may I have the motion for approval of the resignation of Christian Walsh Part-time food service worker, effective February 13th, 2021. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of the retirement of James Ferrioni, uh, custodial worker one, effective March 27th, 2021, after 10 years. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. May I have a motion for the approval of the retirement of James Moran, head custodian, effective March 19th, 2021, after 30 years? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Geller, if I'm, I'm sorry, I should have, when you said discussion, um, you know, we are going to miss both James and James. Um, I had the pleasure as a teacher to have Mr. Moran um, be my partner in my hallway at Udall. And um, it's always been a pleasure to work with both gentlemen and they will be sorely missed. We wish them well in their retirement. Absolutely, thank you. May I have a motion for the approval of permanent substitute teacher Gabrielle Roberto, effective February 24th, 2021 through June 25th, 2021. So moved. Second. Discussion? Is this building specific on these or, or are they just permanent subs within the district? Uh, this would be at the high school. At the high school, thanks. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of Cassidy Comerford as a substitute teacher, effective February 22nd, 2021. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of a substitute teaching assistant, Christina Giordano, uh, effective February 24th, 2021. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, there is a change on the effective date for Ms. Testa in the next group. It should read February the 8th. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of the small group instruction teachers as listed on your agenda? So moved. Second. Discussion? I did, what? I did. Yeah. What, what are these, Brian? That's, that, that was my question. <laughs> these are our remote teachers at the middle school level for our students that are medically compromised and are not able to come to school. So they've been added because that it came up within the year or there? Yes. Are we had, we uh, had several students uh, who, um, have left school because of medical being medically compromised. 
So we needed to add an Italian teacher, which is Ms. Dooley Chiano, and an ASL teacher, which is Ms. Testa. So it's COVID related? COVID yes. Related? Yes. Yes, it's not homebound instruction, Mrs. LaRosa. We're trying to cohort the kids. Um, and so that's why it's small group instruction. It's not one-to-one uh, -one typically. Okay, so it's um, it's not like a full day of teaching. It's not a six hour day. It's it's- Two hours in the afternoon. Okay. After okay. school day. Okay. And those all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of Ryan Volmuth uh, for counseling uh, as a replacement for Wendy Lodigs uh, for the remainder of the school year uh, in our alternative school? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I have a motion for the approval of the clubs and advisors as listed on your agenda. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I have a motion for the approval of the fall coaches as listed on your agenda. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. You're welcome. Okay, can I have a motion for the approval of the 2021-2022 student teacher calendar Naming your backup. So moved. Second. Discussion? Uh, okay, so the first day is the first, so we're starting before Labor Day this year? Yes, four days, um, one superintendent's conference day and three student contact days. The Labor Day weekend falls into the Jewish holidays, Mrs. LaRosa. So it's five day weekend there. So the first, second and third, we're in session. The students are in session. The teachers return on the 31st. So the rest of the staff, not just the teachers, everybody. Everybody's, they're starting in office. Yes. <laughs> it was a tough year with the way all the holidays fell. Yeah, that's an odd one, right? I've never seen anything like it ever. <laughs> Come yeah. back. It seems, it seems every religious holiday is a weekday this year. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then with the addition of Juneteenth in June, that was another day that impacted the calendar. And that's not normally, is that normally a, a, a regents type day? Yes. Um, actually, that Monday, Mr. Tussie, is typically the um, foreign language exams. So I guess they will have to reschedule them at some point. Yeah, sure. yeah. But to your point, if the holiday falls on any other day that week or the week before, it's going to impact the region. Right. Right. Ms. LaRosa, we, we couldn't hear you there. You can't hear me? No, you, you, you suddenly walk on out. That's weird. Now we heard you. Okay. You heard me call you weird? I heard you say that's weird. I'm just going to mute myself anyway. Okay, no comment. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for the acceptance of the internal risk assessment report from Colin and Danowski and related corrective action plan dated January 19, 2021? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Can I have a motion for the approval of the acceptance of the single audit report from RS Abrams and related corrective action plan for year ending June for year ended June 30th, 2020? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
Motion carries. Okay, um, Mrs. Burns, would you like to? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Geller. Sure. sure. I, so I just wanted to bring everybody up to uh, date as far as where we are with our high school instructional program. Um, Mrs. Uh, Morrison has been meeting regularly with the high school team. I know that Dr. Bridgman has been meeting with his team at the high school. Um, we have, as you all know, received a number of requests to bring our high school students back. And in fact, that's what some of the surrounding districts are doing, but there are a lot of considerations, of course. And if and when we do it, we wanna do it right and make sure that the health and safety of our students and staff are um, our primary um, consideration. Uh, one of the things that we do know, and, and we're, we're bombarded with it at this point in the media, but we know that anyway, and there's many educators here among us, is that it isn't strictly the academics and the instructional piece that's so important to our students. These kids have been out of school for all intents and purposes, the school that they knew and loved, I hope, for the better part, just about a year now. Um, and the impact it's having on our high school age students in particular has been in some cases, and I, I don't use the word lightly, devastating. Um, we are seeing a lot of um, you know, concerns being raised by kids themselves, by parents, by our staff as it relates to our students. And we know that the high school setting is the best place for them to be. So we try to weigh um, you know, the implications of COVID with the implications to their mental health. And that's what brings us here today. So. We did poll the parents. We sent out a survey back um, uh, between February 9th and February 16th. We collected some information. It was a very simple survey. Um, there are a little over 1,300 students registered, um, attending, enrolled in the high school. Um, and we had approximately three quarters of our parents responded. There were a lot of duplicated responses. Um, so we removed the duplicates um, and uh, we ended up with 72.8% of parents and guardians responding. And I'll be sending this information out to our parents, um, you know, with Dr. Bridgman um, by the end of the week. We collected their email address, the parents' name, the kids' names, the grade, and then um, asked them um, to tell us if they look forward to a full-time return. Um, we wanted to make the um, realization that there may be some classes, although we strive for six feet, um, possibly five feet. In some cases, um, we were concerned there may be a uh, distancing of only three feet between the students in the classroom. So that was the option that we gave parents. Um, so a, a minimum social distancing of three feet with uh, SED approved barriers, which are the sneeze guards, which already have been mounted um, in the classrooms, by the way. Uh, so that was one option. The second option was the hybrid model as is. And then the third option simply um, elicited information from parents that their child has a medical exemption and was provided with remote instruction. You may recall that we did not offer remote instruction as an option at the high school, um, except for those students who were medically compromised or who lived in a household with someone who was medically compromised. And then we asked if there was anything else um, that the parents wish to share. So ultimately, um, we received 959 unduplicated responses. 76% of our ninth grade parents um, requested full-time school, 70% of 10th grade, 74% of 11th, and 70% of 12th grade um, parents requested that we bring the, back, the kids back full-time. So Overall, the number was um, just over 70%. The request to bring our kids back full time, 27% um, requested um, a continuation of the hybrid setting as it is. So we do continue to work with the high school team. Um, Mrs. Uh, Morrison and, and Mr. Taylor and I met with them earlier today. Uh, we are meeting with the high school teachers tomorrow after school, and then we will have a follow-up meeting with the administrators on Thursday. But Mrs. Morrison, maybe I can impose on you a little bit to share, you know, what you've been discussing and some of the concerns that have been raised and some of the, um, you know, some of the things that we're trying to address. 
Good evening, everybody. So again, um, as Mrs. Burns had said, we are seeing each day the increasing need and the importance of getting our students back um, into the high school full time. We have uh, some students that are really struggling both socially and emotionally, and we're recognizing that the best place for them to be is in school with their friends, with their teachers, following a normal routine. So we have been discussing bringing students back by grade level, five days per week, starting with our senior class, um, with a one to two week transition period between each grade level so that we can see how the transition is going, assess if we're having any challenges, and then of course address those challenges before bringing the next um, grade level back. It is important to note that any timeline we put out um, will be tentative and subject to change based on current COVID-19 data. So if we start to roll things out and we're seeing that the data is not going in the right direction, trending in the right direction, we will make adjustments um, appropriately. It's also important to note that as part of our um, ongoing discussions that when the kids come back full time, uh, we're not expecting it to be business as usual right away. While academics are extremely important, our students and our staff are going to need time to adjust to um, the multitude of variables, uh, new variables that have been um, thrown out at us due to COVID. So we wanna make sure that our students and our staff are supported throughout this transition. As Mrs. Burns had mentioned, um, over the February break, our classrooms um, have been uh, starting the process of being prepared for the full-time return of our students. Desk guards have been um, installed on most of the desks and instructional spaces. Um, we've also put in additional desks in the classroom um, to support the enrollment in each of the classes. Upon the full time of return um, of our students, we're anticipating that the parents and guardians um, will continue to complete the parent square health screener each day before um, students leave their houses. This way, you know, we can ensure that we have healthy students coming to school. COVID-19 sanitization procedures will continue daily with increased attention to classrooms and common areas during the school day. Um, I mentioned today in a meeting that I was very pleased um, to say that every time I've been up and in the high school over the last few months, um, I'm always seeing custodians walking around, spraying, wiping down. Um, so we are doing a great job with that. We will continue to require all students, staff, and visitors um, to wear masks that cover their nose and their mouths, and we will be providing periodic and regular reminders in regard to our health and safety protocols. As Mrs. Burns mentioned, um, desk partitions have been installed on the desks. We will also be looking to keep classroom um, and doorway uh, and door uh, windows open throughout the school day. Um, obviously, the extent is going to depend on the weather. So some days it may be six inches, some days it might be 12 inches, but we are looking to keep the flow of air circulating through the high school in that regard. We're also looking to transition um, between periods uh, with staggered social distancing to ensure that not all of the students are coming out of the classes into the hallway areas at one time. That was something um, that was um, brought up in the responses from parents on the survey, as well as our staff at the high school. So we are looking for a staggered um, transition between periods. Lunch. How would that, how would that work, Don? Excuse me? How would that work? So one of the uh, things that we are talking about is for the phys ed classes and for the lunch periods to be released one to two minutes early. Our biggest area um, that poses our greatest challenge seems to be the 130 hallways where the kids come out of lunch and they're coming out of phys ed. So to release them one to two minutes early and to send our lunch students down the hallway by the auditorium so that everyone is not um, meeting in that intersection there in the 130 hallway. Um, they're also talking again about allowing, let's say uh, 10th graders to go out and then waiting a minute or two and then releasing 11th graders and so on and so forth. So they are in the process of working through that right now. Uh, Mrs. Morrison, I have, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So it's only natural that some classes will have uh, more students than others. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, thought of capping how many kids can go into 
at the class or are we willing to go up to full class size if everyone was to return? So we have looked at classroom capacity issues and in the cases where there appears to be somewhat of a challenge to keep the students at least three feet apart, we have relocated those classes to other classrooms where there is more room. So right now we are very comfortable that we can fit our students into classrooms with a minimum of three feet apart. So you would answer? relocate the entire class, you would re the entire class would relocate? Yes. Yeah, so say like Mr. Tussie's period six class, um, fully enrolled, has a, a larger number of students that we feel is safe for the classroom size, we would relocate that period to a different classroom. And the directors and Dr. Bridgman have been working with the teachers in that regard. So the teachers have been part of the process so that there aren't any surprises there. More excitement of more scheduling issues then. <laughs> yes. yes. And in regard to in regard to the lunch periods, um, once again, we will be keeping the students at least three feet apart. We are looking to put um, picnic tables in the courtyard so that we weather permits, some of the students can go outside into the courtyards. And we're also looking to put some seating out in the auditorium lobby. Um, so that again, we can relieve a little bit of the congestion in the cafeteria. But right now we did an analysis on all lunch periods and we are able to safely fit students um, into the cafeterias uh, three feet apart at the minimum. Uh, Don, Mr. Don, this is Peter, I just have two questions. Uh, with that, is the campus gonna be open or closed for seniors? Can they leave for lunch without help? And then the also, do we have any idea? I know it's, it's, it's we're all trying to get the, the vaccination. Any surveys about how many percentage of our current teachers have been vaccinated yet? Will that help at all by school? I, I know it's ongoing, but uh, just two questions. So actually it's a, a good point. I'm sorry, Dawn, I don't wanna step on your toes. Um, about, um, we talked a bit about the open campus for lunch um, over the course of a, a, quite a while actually. And while it might mitigate some of the challenges there, we're concerned about kids going out in groups together in cars and then eating together in places that are not supervised. Um, I, I think we could provide, um, I would hope a, a more structured setting for kids to make good choices in that regard. Kids are kids. As far as the vaccines go, um, interesting, I don't know if you're aware yet, it will go home in your packet on, on Friday, but the governor um, put out another executive order last night, basically telling us to collect information about whether teachers are vaccinated. And although we know there, it, there is no ex expectation to mandate teachers to be, you know, receive the vaccine, um, on a weekly basis, districts have now been charged with reporting to the Department of Health the number of teachers that were vaccinated that week within their school district. So um, right now, we did collect that information when we were first trying about two, two or three weeks ago, trying to determine, um, you know, who we needed to set up vaccine for should the opportunity arise. Um, there were not that many people at that time within the district. Many people, I'd, I'd say, I'm going to guess here, of approximately 20% were probably in the first go round, but you know, a lot has happened in the last two or three weeks. So we will have a better sense by Friday of where we are as a district, um, but we do have a fair number of people who do not wish to be vaccinated either. Mr. Allbinder, uh, just to continue on with some of the things that we are planning, Mr. Allbinder has ordered special masks for students when they are singing and playing instruments in order to add another layer of protection to keep our musicians safe. And one other focus that uh, the high school has really been talking about is making sure that we have additional supports in place um, to support the social, emotional, and mental well being of our students upon their return. So there's really some great conversations going on. Uh, one issue we keep seeming, uh, we keep focusing on um, is brainstorming challenges that we may face. One of the challenges that continues to come up is how we can effectively educate um, those students that are medically uh, remote at home. 
So teachers have shared that now they're going to have 20 some odd students in front of them and one or two students at home. How are we going to ensure that those students at home are able to be you know, effectively instructed? Um, and that is definitely a um, concern and a, a challenge that we're talking about. I am currently right now going through each of our remote students. I'm looking at their schedules and I'm trying to figure out what staffing would be like if we look to cohort those students into classes like we did at the middle school level. What I'm finding is we have a, a large number of classes and it's just something that um, I'm not really sure at this point how doable it's going to be, but I am in the process right now of going through and checking to see what staffing um, would be necessary in order to do that. Um, as Mrs. Burns mentioned, um, she, myself, Mr. Taylor, we are going to the high school tomorrow to speak with the staff and we have another administrative meeting scheduled for Thursday. Um, we are appreciative of the feedback that we are receiving from all stakeholders. We ask that it keep coming. Um, it's really bringing us to great places. And um, we hope to have some more information to share with everyone um, within the next week or so. Ms. Morrison, I think you said that um, we were looking at uh, a phase in of one to two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's that contingent on at, at this point or? That's really contingent on the um, COVID data that we are receiving. Are we seeing any um, spreading in the building? Are we having a large number of students that are you know, coming down with the virus? So it's really going to be dependent on day to day on the data that we're seeing related to COVID. Okay. So we do have an obligation to our staff to provide them with five, day no five days notice if we're changing the schedules. And although we're not changing the schedules per se, it may certainly impact the manner in which they're planning if they have more children in front of them, as opposed to that split hybrid method. So we would like to make sure that we provide um, as much notice as possible. Um, so we do not have any specific dates, but um, we would, as Mrs. Morrison points out, like to roll them in over a period of weeks. It would probably take you know, well over a month um, but the first group sometime within the next few weeks um, beginning so that we could get one or two groups back before the April break, um, evaluate how we're doing and then bring back the other classes. Okay, wait, wait a second. So you're talking about bringing the first group in within a month? Um, within the next few weeks. The, at this point, um, Right now, specifically, that's holding you up from starting next week. Um, well, I would, I'm a little concerned about Monday, May, March 1st, I guess it is, just because we're still in the middle of coming back from many people traveled, we're discovering this past vacation, and with a two to 10 day incubation period, we're a little concerned about bringing everybody back into a very dense environment. And it also doesn't uh, doesn't provide you know, um, the notice required or expected for, for the teachers to plan. So, so the earliest I would recommend would be March eighth. Okay, so the earliest, based upon the notice to the teachers to start planning their curriculum, would be March eighth. And so, what's holding us from setting that as the date we return? I think that's what we're talking about. Well, no, because she just said, you know, next couple of weeks or within a month, we're going to bring the next, the first group in. I, if, I, why we're if, waiting. If, if, if everybody is in agreement, we will work toward that date. If people yeah. travel, then they, they, they're obliged to follow the state guidelines for quarantining. So if they took a vacation, they should be following whatever rules they are. Test before you came back, quarantine for three days, test again. You're, you're negative, you're, you're good to go. But, you know, I, I, I don't think pushing our date out based upon a vacation makes really much sense. I'm comfortable with March 8th based on the um, potential spike, but more importantly, uh, more critical at this point, the, uh, the need for notification. Well, the March 8th gets us past the quarantine anyway, or the 14 days after, after the vacation, so. Right, and there'll be other breaks and there'll be other vacations and there'll be other people going away. And I think as a community, you know, we just need to make sure that everybody, everybody needs to do that. 
should, you know, do that, but please make sure you follow the quarantine notices upon return. Yes. It's, everybody has to work together in that effort. Same as wearing your mask and staying away from each other. If you travel, you have to quarantine. Well, I do think we are asking our staff to shift the manner of instruction. So I, I do think that extra week would be valued. So um, I, I'm reluctant to go with Monday because it's well, right around the corner. March 1st just seems like a short notice. I agree. And so, and, and March 8th, we get us get it past the, the 14 days. Going beyond so, that really means that you won't get your freshman back until you're ready to close school in June. So if you're going to do it, let's, you know, go ahead and do it. But what's the first day of the spring break? Um, March 29th, I believe. March 29th. March 29th, yes. So ideally, we could get two groups back before the break, um, you know, for at least a week or so. And then after the break, we can bring back the other groups. And, and you know, once we work out the wrinkles, I think we'll be able to accelerate bringing the groups back. But we certainly, and we'll make it very public, we certainly all agree um, from an administrative perspective, and I, I believe our staff, that, that we really need to get our seniors back. So but is it going to be March 8th and then each week we'd bring another group back? Or, or maybe the first go around two weeks, Mr. McGinnis, just to make sure, you know, everything's running smoothly. But then after that, we could accelerate that. Okay. Yep, I'm fine. I mean, I think we need to do whatever we can to get them back as fast as possible. So that sounds like a good plan. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Mr. McGinnis. I, I'd certainly like to see us shorten that two weeks if possible. Um, you know, if something comes up, we can, we, you know, as Mrs. Morrison said, if something develops, we, we can move it out. But if we don't try to do it sooner, we, we won't. So. Yep, makes sense. To Compatella, did you, your, your, your face lit up. I didn't know if you wanted to say something. No, I think it's a good plan. Get them back as soon as you can and get them all back as soon as, soon as you can. Don't delay it. I, I, I think I think we've all heard from, you know, parents uh, whose kids are, are really feeling it. So I think we need to get them back as soon as we can. Okay, we'll make it happen. We've got Thank a good you. team, so. Okay, um, with that said, uh, can I have a motion to adjourn to, to executive session where the board will discuss, uh, discuss uh, litigation, personnel, and negotiations? We'll move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, we uh, hope to see uh, many of you uh, in person on uh, in two weeks at 